Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing the RTX GeForce line of graphics cards, specifically performance information from NVIDIA themselves, optimization, and just, well, a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, we're going to be starting things out with Tom Peterson, who was recently speaking to Hot Hardware. I'm going to link to their specific video in the description of this video if you want to go ahead to check it out. But to me, there were a couple of major highlights that I want to discuss with you in this video. The main highlight to me was him officially confirming the performance jump from the Pascal generation to, of course, Turing. Now, he focused primarily on the RTX 2080 Ti, and he revealed that we're going to be looking at a 35 to 45% jump from the 1080 Ti to the RTX 2080 Ti. Now, of course, there is that gap of around 10%. And why is that? Well, of course, it does depend on how well a game engine leverages uh, advantages Turing might have. So there are some rumors, for example, that asynchronous shaders with Turing will perform a little bit better and DirectX 12 as a whole. Plus, of course, if, for example, an application was more back memory bandwidth limited, or perhaps it uh, requires some of, or takes advantage of some of the uh, tweaks that they've made to cache or whatever, and then those most certainly will nudge the performance numbers up a little bit compared to Pascal. I also want to uh, clarify that this is not with DLSS or uh, ray tracing or anything like that. This is just purely a game, for example, The Witcher 3, running on Pascal, and then you were to plonk in instead the uh, RTX 2080 tie, and these are the type of performance numbers that you would get. It also doesn't take into account, let's say, overclocked versions of the cards, and obviously, as we start to see uh, more Turing cards filter onto store shelves, I'm sure the clock speeds will go up, much like we saw with Pascal. So, okay, enough of that. What about performance numbers, and is it worth upgrading for you, and how about the other GPUs? Well, I decided to take a few of our own uh, performance metrics with Rise of the Tomb Raider and other bits and pieces. In fact, we did do a B360 review where I used a lot of these results, but the reason we have so many is because we also do a CPU core scaling video. So if you want to see, for example, how a GTX 1080 Ti does on, let's say, one processor core, well, you can find that in the video description. The hint is actually kind of better than what you'd expect. But anyway, let's go through some of the results, shall we? I've only got four games because uh, I want to clarify that this is not a benchmark. We have not benchmarked this, but we're simply taking 1.4, which is obviously the average of 1.35 to 1.45, and basically timesing it by the results we had of the RTL, oh, sorry, of the GTX 1080 Ti, which was a Founders Edition model. So we're going to start things out with Rise of the Tomb Raider High uh, 4K. So with the uh, tie uh, RT with the 1080 tie, we got 68.78. Let's just call it 69 frames a second. And that goes up to 97 frames a second with the RTX uh, 2080 tie. I'm just going to call it the 80, and we're just going to call it the 10 and the 20, just to make life simple uh, for this video, because I wasn't going to go nuts. The 10 got 77 frames a second in Batman Arkham Knight at 4K with a frame maxed, and 107.8 with this theoretical RTX 2080 tie. The turn on Hitman uh, at 4K with ultra settings gets 69 frames a second, and then we get 96 and a half frames a second with the 20. And Dios X, we are looking at 47 frames a second once again, everything maxed with the GTX 1080 Ti. And finally, 65.8, let's just call it 66 frames per second with the RTX 2080 Ti. Of course, there is definitely a larger spec difference between the TI and the vanilla RTX 2080. Therefore, it's possible that the RTX 2080 will slightly have a larger performance lead. So let's say it might be closer to the 45-ish percent compared to that of the vanilla 2080, which might be a little bit lower. The performance leaks we're hearing at the moment, and you can also check out the performance uh, information you can see yourself for the 1080 versus the TI, the 1080 TI. And from what we're hearing, the RTX 2080 TI from the previous leaks looks to be a few percent faster, let's say between 5 and 10 percent faster than the 1080 Ti. So in other words, the pecking order will be something along the lines of you have the RTX 2080 Ti, you have the RTX 2080, then we can presume we're probably going to have the RTX, uh, sorry, the GTX 1080 Ti, then we're probably going to have the RTX 2070, and then of course you're going to go down the uh, Pascal stack, and who knows 
how the 2060 and so on are going to fit into things. Now, some people are going to immediately say, what, 40% for that price? That's kind of disappointing. Well, in my opinion anyway, the performance jump is not too bad. Um, if you were to look at previous generations of NVIDIA cards, and by all means, you can also use AMD or ATI back in the day, I suppose, and other companies as well. And the performance jumps are not actually always huge. And you have to also take into consider a ray tracing and tensor cores and all that stuff. But let's focus primarily on the performance just for a moment. So let's go way back into the days of the GTX 480 versus the 580. Now, one of the key issues with the 400 series was <laughs> the heat, right? We all know that. I actually decided to jump on a 480 back in the day because it put out slightly, and I do mean just a titch, better performance than the 570. So the performance leap between the two generations, and I say generations in a really loose way, it was simply a refresh between the 500 and the 400, was around 10, 12%, depending once again on the application. The GTX 680 compared to the 580 was only around 19, 20, 25% at best, depending once again on the game. It's still not bad or anything like that, but still nowhere near the 40% we're seeing here. In fact, the closest jump that we have in terms of the performance metrics was actually from the 780 Ti to the 980 Ti, where once again, you were looking at the 35 to 45% increase in performance. And some of that actually in some games is probably memory as well, because obviously the 780 Ti only had three gigabytes of memory. It was actually kind of weird for a while. There were some games like Resident Evil 7 is a classic example where the game actually had issues on the 780 Ti when it was swapping data backwards and forwards, but the actual shaders were fine. So it's kind of weird, like uh, some games actually were faster on, let's say, the uh, 780 Ti back in the day compared to, let's say, the R9 290X, but the 290X actually aged better because of that additional RAM. It's beside the point, but still. But then, of course, we got spoiled, and we were looking at 60 and 70% leaps from Pascal compared to Maxwell, or to put it another way, the 980 and the 980 Ti versus the 1080 and the 1080 Ti. And why is that? Well, there are several different reasons. For one, we had a leap in process technology. NVIDIA also released a drastically improved architecture, which was just monstrously improved when it came to pure raw clock speed. We also saw the inclusion of GDDR5X memory, which of course saw memory bandwidth go absolutely through the roof and combine that with better compression technology. What does all of that mean? Well, basically, Pascal was one of those GPUs which was just like, just it, everything just came together. And I don't like to use this comparison because it's apples to oranges. But it's the best comparison that I can think of off the top of my head. And, you know, I, you don't have to agree with anything I'm saying here, by the way. This is just my personal opinion. And by the way, we're not getting a review sample from NVIDIA or anything like that. We're actually going to be buying our own RTX 2080 graphics card because we want to continue the coverage from you guys. Uh, and, well, we don't want to... Yeah, we, we're just basically buying our own card because obviously we need GPUs and stuff for the channel anyway. And that's partly, by the way, where your Patreon cash goes and why when you watch ads and stuff on the videos and do all of this cool stuff, it helps us to once again purchase this equipment. So anyway, so <laughs> from my point of view, the RTX 2080 better be a bloody good card. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of like Pascal was a bit like Sandy Bridge. You know what I'm talking about. Like Sandy Bridge, the 2500, the 2600 were amazing processors. And they had everything going for them. The architecture was a classic leap over Conroe, over Core 2 Geo and Core 2 Quads. Not that those were bad processors, they were incredible as well. Um, but as we all know, Sandy Bridge was amazing. And you can make a really compelling argument that if you have like a 2600K, especially a 2600K, and you've overclocked it really heavily, and you're running at a high resolution, you're probably going to be okay for the next year or two of games. Not not all games, by all, you know, by all means, you're going to definitely be frame rate limited in certain titles like Ash of the Singularity and other type games. But generally speaking, you're not going to be too bad off. 
And that's kind of what Pascal was. It was that perfect uh, mixture of a new process node, a new architecture, a ridiculously high clock speed, and blah, 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 blah. And it all just came together. Really. Another really cool uh, piece of information that's popped up from Eurogamer. Uh, the folks over there actually were managing to speak to the guys over at EA Dice and also NVIDIA and uh, so on. And they actually found out optimization information. Now, in my opinion, this stuff should have been released much earlier from the developers. They should have released this information in public interviews. And quite why they didn't manage to wrangle this out of them. Uh, and they didn't just release this information publicly, I don't really know, because it actually makes the cards a lot better. Essentially, what they're saying is, in comes in, when it comes to ray tracing on their particular graphics pipeline, and once again, I'm going to link to their article, you can find that in the video description, but um, it's a rather fascinating read. The takeaway here is that they're basically just <laughs> implementing ray tracing in a not very optimized way. They're putting it rather late into the render pipeline. I don't want to make this video super technical because it's outside the remit of this video, but basically they're putting it in so late into the pipeline that the GPU is not able to work asynchronously. If they put it in earlier, it could actually speed things up by a couple of milliseconds, two to three milliseconds. Now you may say to yourself, well, that's a load of crap. What the hell does two milliseconds do? Well, don't forget to hit 60 FPS, you have to actually hit a render time of 16.67 milliseconds so each frame you have that budget so imagine if you're hitting like 18 milliseconds and then you just do that one trick you're immediately hitting your budget it's huge right furthermore they're saying that they're also still kind of optimizing how they do it one of the options they might have especially if they're doing it early in the render pipeline is to basically run with fewer samples or ray trace at a lower quality and then upsample that for the for the end image and there are other things as well they could do they could also use a more mixture of rasterization techniques and so on and so on but the bottom line is for me uh, ray tracing is still really early with these games it's not where it should be and they know that and they've only been working on this essentially for a couple of weeks And I also want to point out one small little thing. It's not just about games looking better. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I do love the visuals of ray tracing, but there is something else that we also have to take into consideration, and that is smaller studios. So back in the day of like AAA development, um, I, I'm going to use a really simple example. Because I was watching uh, the gaming historian just recently. It's actually one of the few YouTube channels I watch. And he was going over Spyro, which was, by the way, a game I never played when it was released. And he was pointing out how tiny the team was. Like one dude basically programmed the entire game engine, right? And of course, John Carmack did much the same thing with the original Doom, and he put much of the work in as well for Quake. And you get the idea. The reason I'm bringing that up is because back in the day, very small studios could put out visuals which look really impressive, at least for the time. That's no longer the case because artists need to put so much work into things such as screen space reflection. And my point is that this will, at least when ray tracing really catches on, it will allow developers to put out things that, yes, do look better visually, but more importantly, allows tri uh, AAA studios to perhaps scale down their team some or uh, reduce this time that it takes to put out games because a lot of the time goes into creating shadows and lighting and reflections blah 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 but it also means that smaller studios studios which don't necessarily have huge budgets or perhaps are just like 12 or 15 or 20 people they can actually put out games which look really impressive because of ray tracing now finally and this is kind of tying everything i'm saying here together and that is that I do believe that NVIDIA are still working rather um, a lot on Turing and ray tracing and the whole architecture. And I do believe that Southern NM shrink is almost inevitable. I think one of the things they're going to be doing, and I did do a Turing analysis recently, we, learned, we were discussing the number of tensor cores per SM. And another thing we did learn, of course, is there is one ray tracing core per SM. So that means if you've got 68... Uh, 
SMs, that means you have 68 RT cores. So inevitably, there's a good chance that one of the optimizations they could do is simply increase that number with a die shrink. They could perhaps bump it up to two uh, RT cores per SM. That's just a theory. Another possibility is they could just increase the number of SMs, period, which might be the better way to go. Obviously, it depends on how they kind of go forward. It also depends on if they can make their SMs more efficient. I'm sorry, the RT cores more efficient, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there's definitely a lot of stuff to say there. So anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed this bit of a Turing update video. It's more of a ramble than what I'd intended. But <laughs> yeah, hopefully, as I said, you've enjoyed it and found it somewhat informative for something. I'm also going to give a one final uh, announcement. This is not anything bad, just for your FYI. I will actually be going once again to America. I'm going to be going to Seattle to meet up with a group of friends. I'm going to be there for a month. However, fear not, I will still be producing content because I'm going to be taking a laptop with me. In fact, rather kindly, HP Computers have, this is not a sponsored video or anything like that, but they have asked me uh, if I'd like to borrow a laptop, uh, just, you know, kind of, to use it and maybe give them the odd shout out, which I'm doing here. Once again, not sponsored or anything like that. No money's exchanging hands, but they've loaned me a laptop, which is really kind of them. And uh, so I'll be still working in the States. I'm actually already scheduled a couple of really cool interviews while I'm there as well. So definitely check those out. <laughs> One of them's really cool. And I'm going to be meeting up with a couple of friends. And that does also remind me, if you happen to live in the Seattle region, I'm not going to give the exact address because I'm going to be staying with a couple of friends. Um, but if you do want to meet up with me, uh, I've actually met up with someone before in Seattle. It's really cool. His name's John and him and I have actually become quite good friends. So that's awesome. I'm actually looking forward to meeting him again. And he and I are going to be doing some really cool retro gaming stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway, if you do want to meet up with me, it's going to be nothing like, formal or anything like that we're not going for like you know any conventions or anything like that it will just be like going out to video game stores or something silly uh do let me know and we can maybe do a meetup you can probably best email me on that one that's paul p-a-u-l at redgamingtech.com with all of that said hopefully you have enjoyed the video i'll see you soon my friends bye for now